Griffith University and um, one of the leaders in the um, Griffith Climate Action Beacon. Before we get started, um, I'll be begin by acknowledging the country that I'm on today, which is Bundjalung country, beautiful Bundjalung country here in northern New South Wales, and uh, encourage you all to, um, I mean, to really think what that means to acknowledge country um, and what that means in terms of um, your place and position here um, uh, in what is now known as Australia. Um, for today's presentation, which is all about the creative arts, it's it's wonderful also to reflect on, reflect on the indivisibility between arts and cultural practice for our First Nations people, and the and the wonderful um, the absolute privilege we are to have the oldest art in the world um, as um, happening at our place, and the most beautiful um, contemporary um, Indigenous arts and cultural practice. Um, so. And alongside that, um, acknowledge that this um, that that art and that cultural practice sits within a um, within a broader political context where um, First Nations people um, have had their land stolen, and um, acknowledging that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, paying my absolute respect um, and gratitude to all First Nations people present here today. Um, uh, elders especially, and um, encouraging you also to, to really reflect on what it means to acknowledge country and to think about the country you're on. So, um, and my sincere gratitude that I get to share any of that cultural heritage, what, a, what an absolute privilege that is, another one. Um, today, uh, we're, we're here to, for our, our Climate Action Beacon webinar. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, with us today people, the directors, two of the directors from Pearl, the Performance and Ecology uh, Research Lab, which is an initiative that sits within the um, Griffith Creative Arts Research Institute, and one that is absolutely one of my um, one of my favourite uh, initiatives in terms of Griffith and climate action. Um, the directors and those people associated with this uh, Pearl initiative. Performance and Ecology Research Lab, just so you get the acronym right, Pearl, it's lovely. Um, uh, the directors, uh, Tanya Beer, um, uh, Natalie Lazaro, and also Linda Hassel are really, this is cutting edge um, innovation, leading Australian um, creative and cultural industries in terms of uh, looking um, outwards in terms of the, the, what they create, um, but also looking inwards at the industry itself so that it can be, it's a part of this, um, part of this transition to a better and more sustainable relationship between ourselves and the planet. Um, so uh, really, um, really proud and um, excited to hear what you have to say today, uh, Tanya and Natalie. Um, I'll let you know that the Performance and Ecology Research Lab is an initiative dedicated to furthering climate justice across all aspects of contemporary theatre making and building sustainable futures in and beyond performing arts. And as I said, we have the th um, two of the directors presenting today. Um, the first is um, Tanya Beer, who's um, on the right of my screen. Um, Tanya Beer is a senior lecturer in design at the Queensland College of Art and Design at Griffith. She originally tra trained as a set and costume designer. Her extensive career as an ecological designer, community artist and researcher builds on more than 20 years of theatre practice. Tanya's pioneering concept of eco Eco scenography. Oh, isn't that terrible? <laughs> Eco scenography. That's okay. Eco scenography. It's, 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 a, it's a mouthful. Yeah. It's, it's Friday. Very, it's very niche. Thank yes. you, Tanya. Thank you for you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, has been featured in numerous programs, ex exhibitions, articles, and platforms around the world. She is the author of Eco Scenography, an introduction to ecological design for performance, in um, published in 2021. Um, Natalie Lazaro is a um, a lecturer in education and drama at Griffith University, where her research interests lie in cultural citizenship, socially engaged performance, arts-based research, and decentering and decolonizing methodologies. Natalie has received grants for her work into the arts and cultural citizenship into 
into the arts and cultural citizenship with disadvantaged young people in Singapore, where she has been involved in a long-term and ongoing collaboration. And I might just um, introduce Linda as well, if that's all right, Tanya and Natalie. I know that this, this team of um, Pearl co-directors are just doing some amazing work. So, Linda... I think you're there in the audience, but I know that you're in a video. Uh, Linda Hassel is a deputy convener of the BA in um, the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. Her research focuses on devising and producing contemporary performance and explores the relationship between theatre and climate change. Uh, she further explores the developing of sustainable production technologies in response to theatre's carbon footprint. Linda is the author of Theatres of Dust, Climate Gothic Analysis in Contemporary Australian Drama and Performance, Landscape she is also an award-winning playwright, playwright of Post Office Rose, and the director of Salvation in 2012. Um, one of the most uh, uh, encountering uh, the work of Pearl, uh, one of the, the projects that really stands out for me is Culture for Climate, which is a pilot project, which is a preliminary study conducted by the authors of Pearl um, into how the Australian performing arts organisations and performing arts organisations are responding to the global environmental crisis. What innovation, what fantastic, meaningful and worthwhile work. So over to you, uh, Tanya and uh, Natalie. I'm um, looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Kerry. Um, and thanks, Climate Action Beacon, for inviting us to be part of this webinar and for all the support that we've we've received from the Climate Action Beacon. Um, Tanya and I would like to acknowledge that we are residing and we work on the lands of the Yagara and Turbo peoples and that traditional land owners have had a long-standing and very deep knowledge of caring for the lands, caring for the waterways and that First Nations people acknowledge that really intertwined relationship between the ecological and the cultural as well. So we really pay respect to those knowledges um, and we learn a lot from these knowledges that are, you know, that are held by First Nations people. Um, as uh, here's just a picture of us from a symposium that we ran, which we will be talking about in just a bit. But as Kerry mentioned, uh, Linda, who's in the middle of the photograph, Tanya and myself are co-directors of Pearl, or the Performance and Ecology Research Lab, and we are dedicated to furthering climate justice across all aspects of contemporary theatre making. We are relatively young, a young research lab, having been officially launched um, in March last year through the support of CARI, or the Creative Arts Research Institute. And as um, Kerry also mentioned, we actually all come from, the three of us come from different schools. So Tanya is from the school of, um, from Queensland College of Art and Design. I'm from Education and Professional Studies. And Linda is from Humanities, Languages and Social Science. So we really do come with an interdisciplinary knowledge very much complementary in our strengths and expertise. And actually all three of us come from um, really community-based work, uh, driven by um, social justice, which then led to our passion for climate justice. And we'll talk about this later on, but we do see these um, frames of justices as really being intertwined as well. So what we, uh, what we're gonna do in this webinar is we'll, talk you through some of the projects, uh, both the research and the creative research projects that we've been doing. Uh, you can see one of the photos there of me standing on a trapeze, so we'll talk about that in just a bit. And then after we kind of um, talk about the projects that we've been involved in, we're going to introduce the emerging concept of eco-creativity um, and also its applications within cultural practice. So we really launched in 2023 with the culture, uh, culture for Climate report, which Kerry already mentioned. It was very much our launch pad as a lab and um, very much has framed where we're going with our research um, from here on in. We looked at performing arts organisations specifically because that's where we're based. And we're really interested in exploring how the Australian performing arts sector was responding to the climate crisis, what was going on in the sector. And this report was really the first of its kind to actually do so. There was very little 
information on this topic, very sporadic. And when we looked at what was happening around the rest of the world, uh, we didn't have a lot of information about what was happening here in Australia. So we looked at 13 Australian performing arts organisation across the country. So quite a small group in many ways, but we wanted to deep dive a little bit into how they were uh, handling this topic across programming practices and policies, what we actually talked about as being the three P's. So... Our aims were essentially to examine how the Australian performing arts sector was responding to the climate crisis. So what are they currently doing across the three Ps? How are they thinking about it in the way in which they program work? But also what about the practices behind the work? And uh, do they actually have policy frameworks in place? We were really keen on identifying industry leaders and um, looking at how this, um, what were the industry leaders across the major performing arts organisations? So, you know, those big kind of uh, big uh, performing arts complexes, for example, but also what's happening at the grassroots level? What's happening in the independence? Um, what are they doing at the intersection of live performance and environmental advocacy? And then the third one was really thinking, okay, what kind of strategies are they using um, on this approach? What are some of the lead tools, um, ways of thinking about um, how they're intersecting with the climate agenda? So some of the overall insights um, that we had was over this, um, we did this project over about probably about nine months. And, um, and from that, we kind of brought together some of the key uh, insights that were happening in the sector. So one of the things that we realised that we need moving forward is um, strategic support. So we found that there were a lot of people that were doing ad hoc kind of sustainability, but um, often didn't have a climate policy in place and they weren't always communicating what they were doing. And so there were a lot of people doing individual things, but actually not really aware of each other, which was, we found, um, a missed opportunity. Uh, that lack of visibility is something that we're really keen um, to work towards, um, really showcasing what the sector is doing and really celebrating the great work that's out there. Um, probably not surprising for a lot of people that work in the arts is that the independent sector was really leading the way. And, um, and often they are more agile, um, they can be um, more responsive to what is happening in the world. And, um, and that was great to see, and we really wanted to showcase them. But we also realised that the major performing arts organisations also have to come on board, and they were perhaps, based on what we could find, the least active in this space. Um, some of the things that we identified need to be uh, pursued are strategies for reducing emissions. Um, so we need to think about how emission reduction actually applies to the performing arts more broadly um, and how we approach that in the specificity of that. Um, we want to explore best practices in sustainable processes and procurement. Um, we want to see culture and the performing arts in this case as an agent for change. And we want to share knowledge more widely, not only across the sector, but also with our communities. So I guess we're kind of building what we're calling a culture for climate series. And so leverage, leveraging off the report, the culture for climate report, we then um, organized a culture for climate symposium in September last year. Um, and this was done in blended mode. So we had people in person at the ship in in Brisbane, but we also had um, uh, technical support to actually live stream people in as well, including um, our keynotes. So the aim of this symposium was to actually bring together um, industry, practitioners, interested academics, so that we could all engage in a community of practice and engage in discussions about how the performing arts can actually make a difference in a climate changed world. Um, and just like our Culture for Climate report, we organized the symposium according to our three strands of um, programming, practice and policy. And then each strand had uh, a keynote speaker that was international whom we streamed in, followed then by a panel of experts that were making waves in that those um, specific strands. One of the in exciting things that uh, about that Culture for Climate Symposium is that we were able to get um, 
a special, I guess, a special presenter the night before. Um, and we organized a free webinar and Q&A session. And this presenter was uh, Rufus Norris, who was who is the artistic director of the National Theatre in London. And I think it was really exciting for us because uh, Norris is actually one of the most high profile theatre artists globally. And the National Theatre in London is also a leader in sustainability practices within the theatre sector itself. Um, but part of the symposium at the Ship Inn was that um, there was a what we called a build your own policy session, where because of the gaps that we um, identified in the report, but also you know in the in the most recent national cultural policy, environmental sustainability was not mentioned. So there was a lack of I guess a single national policy around sustainability within the cultural sector. And so we wanted to see what the delegates who were at the event thought about what they needed to see in policy. So that was the way that we kind of ended off um, the symposium. And then following that, the third, I guess, part of our Culture for Climate series is um, that we are launching the, the the culture for climate national survey and I would like to again thank the cultural uh, the climate action beacon for the fellowship that helps to support uh, our ability to do so and so with this survey we've been working with both industry and academic partners to actually develop the questions um, so our industry partners include companies organizations like one stone who are sustainability consultants and they've worked with places like the Sydney Opera House. We're working with PAC Australia, who is the peak body that represents the performing arts sector. We're working with Arts on Tour, which is the peak body organization for arts touring in New South Wales. We're also working with Charcoal Blue, who is an integrated co company, um, theater and consultancy company, um, who very much focus on um, social goals like sustainability. And also, in, um, excitingly, with the Theatre Green Book Australia. And the Theatre Green Book is the key resource that supports the performing arts sector's transition towards sustainable practices. And from what we know that uh, is that this is going to be the first nationwide scope into the environmental sustainability efforts of the Australian performing arts sector. So we're quite excited about that as well. And we are going to launch uh, the survey with one of our partners with PAC Australia at their Apex Forum um, this August in Melbourne. So that's sort of where we've got up to in terms of the Culture for Climate series. Um, I do want to talk about another project that we've done. Um, so this is called Climatescape. And last year, Pearl worked with Volcano Circus here in Brisbane. Uh, and we really wanted to explore how circus can communicate climate challenges uh, as well as ecological well-being. So the work was actually based on our Griffith colleagues um, and social science researchers, Kaya Berry and Samit Suleiman, uh, primarily two articles that they had written. So one of the articles uh, from Kaya and Samit is called A Tour Around the Mud Flats. And then their second article is called Bordering Migratory Shorebirds Through Contested Mobility Developments. So both Kaya and Samit were integral to our creative exploration. So instead of me talking about the project, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you a four minute give or take video that talks about or that documents and talks about the creative um, process. And it also includes really short interviews with Linda Hassel, one of our co uh, directors of Pearl, as well as a couple of the circus performers uh, with the Volcana Artistic Director Celia White, and Samit talks about um, his involvement in this creative development as well. And you'll see me um, in that video as because I was one of the um, circus performers in that um, creative development project. So Carrie, could you just let me know if the volume comes through for you?
So that was um, ClimateScape, but another project that we're, we've, we've also been working on is uh, the flood project. So I think, um, you know, many of us here in Brisbane especially would remember the floods that hit Brisbane uh, within the past decade and a, a bit over. So, the, you know, the one in 2011 and then more recently in 2023. So the flood project was in many ways a response to this, uh, making us think about how we as practitioners, researchers, et cetera, can facilitate community and environmental care and renewal through performance. So importantly, with this project, it was about developing a dram dramaturgical framework for creating theatre or creating performance within disaster affected communities, um, but doing so in ways that were both um, socially and ecologically ethical. So in our exploration, what we did was we explored sustainable practices uh, for the creation of site-specific performances, so performances that take place not in, I guess, conventional theatre buildings, but in those um, spaces where the stories emerge from themselves. Um, and, and especially doing so in sites that have experienced um, ecological trauma or climate disaster. Another project that we worked on uh, last year, this was one of her our, our more recent projects, is... Um, is an external consultancy project that we got with the National Institute, Institute of Dramatic Arts, uh, NIDA. Some of you may know um, of NIDA as Australia's premier um, performing arts school. And our major uh, task here was to embed sustainability across all of the degrees, including bachelor's, master's and vet diploma programs. As we as far as we know, it's the first of its kind in Australia, and um, we really were working to create resources that were at the forefront of global best practice. Um, the Pearl team and NIDA course leaders worked together to identify and create learning content to inform current thinking and practices in sustainable production across theatre, screen and live events. And we're really excited that this year, the 2024 curriculum now includes bespoke class exercises, resources and case studies that address specific environmental sustainability opportunities and challenges across all the NIDA disciplines, including acting, cultural leadership, stage design, directing, dramatic writing, technical theatre and stage management. And I think this was uh, such an uh, opportunity and a privilege for Pearl to uh, actually work uh, on the ground with really having a stake in the next generation of performing arts practitioners um, and culture makers uh, more broadly. So um, they're moving into across all the arts, um, including film, as well as theatre um, and live events. And, and this gen the next generation that are coming out of NIDA are really going to be leading the way. Um, so I think we're going to see another transformation happen in the next three years as they start to graduate from that course. So um, why is the, the intersection uh, of culture and climate so important? So ecological issues are driven by cultural narratives. And if we agree that the climate crisis calls for a shift as a society in the way we view the world and our relationship to it, then culture has a pivotal role to play in this transition. Oh, sorry. Now we're just doing the next slide. Yeah, so um, essentially we at Pearl see two significant themes for investigation. Um, in terms of um, cultural practice. Um, we're interested in the role that the arts can play in developing sustainable practices uh, within the field itself. So transitioning to a sustainable framework and a way of working for our, um, our industry, essentially. And the second one is the role that arts can play in promoting sustainability values in society more broadly. So I think those two uh, themes or uh, steps forward are really crucial to what we do here at FURL and, um, and where we hope um, culture will start to lead on the climate. And what I really, I suppose, as performing arts practitioners, we're really excited because the performing arts literally, as well as metaphorically, has a platform to showcase new ideas and new technologies. And what's really interesting is that 
Despite this platform and this opportunity, there are still some challenges to overcome in our field. So when I started this research about 12 years ago, when I, I did my PhD on ecological design for performance um, as a set and costume designer going back into academia, um, these were some of the things that the industry said to me. There were a lot of assumptions that practitioners had when it came to sustainability in the performing arts. 12 years on, I think we have made some progress um, towards challenging these assumptions. However, many of these concerns still prevail, especially in the Australian context. And this is hardly surprising because I think more broadly as a society, we tend to see sustainability as a problem uh, rather than an opportunity. And this glass half empty approach is not helping. And I think it's really important as culture makers that we, we see sustainability ultimately as thriveability, thinking from a place of abundance, not scarcity. And these ideas of uh, abundance um, and opportunity are integral to our ideas of eco-creativity which are based essentially on the notion of the ecological worldview, a way at looking at the world in a holistic and integral um, way. So some of these ideas that we've taken from the ecological worldview or, or that are foundation to eco-creativity are notions such as deep ecology, um, indigenous knowledge systems, regenerative sustainability and eco-pedagogy. And this kind of frames essentially that intersectional approach between, um, I suppose, the artist and, and ecology more broadly. Yeah, and so if we, you know, if we see the world as an in interconnected social ecological system, then we can see it as part of our broader cultural framework, right? So we see all these processes as intertwined. So we see ecology, um, culture, artistic processes, and the social world, right? And understanding that the human and non-human or more than human are inextricably entangled across bodies, substances and ecosystems. And so therefore, when we, you know, when we think about culture and eco-creativity eco in cultures, then it's about seeing those interconnections between the social and the ecological. And so when it comes to things like sustainability in both environmental and ecological terms, we understand that these terms are actually grounded in social justice and citizenship or in global citizenship. But what, what we think is important as well is that we don't just want to focus on the social ecological challenges, but we also want to find ways to celebrate things like social ecological resilience. So eco-creativity encourages cultural practitioners and educators to think beyond linear resource intensive modes of production and operation to fuse artistic innovation with ecological transformation. And importantly, this is about moving beyond more eco-efficient notions of impact mitigation because eco-creativity combines ecological thinking and sustainable processes with creativity to inspire long-term solutions to environmental so and social issues in cultural practice. And it's really about fostering an approach that frames sustainability as one of opportunity, innovation and leadership for cultural makers. It's about understanding impact and mitigation. That's definitely part of the picture, but actually st striving beyond that, thinking about how can we not only um, mitigate impact, but how can we also give back to um, our local more than human communities. And as artists, I guess essentially we are storytellers. And so uh, when it comes to eco-creativity eco and storytelling, we need to think about, you know, the narratives that we tell, but also how we tell them, right? So how do we reimagine things like performance making and storytelling by drawing on um, ecological ideas from our imaginings, from the landscape, from myth and from cultural memory so that we are considering what our relationships as human beings are in this climate changed world. And so eco-creativity is both about the stories we tell and how we tell them. We're interested in how eco-creativity activates imagination and connection across audiences. We're interested in how it can be agentic in the cultural experience. So with that in mind, 
um, what's next for Pearl? Uh, we are exploring all these ideas, you know, around eco-creativity and what that means uh, in an upcoming, in our upcoming co-authored monograph that Linda, Tanya and myself will be working on. And that's titled Towards Eco-Creativity, Drama, Theatre and Performance Design in a Climate Change World. So again, um, you know, this is building on our collective strengths around eco-scenography, eco-pedagogies and eco-playwriting um, to offer new insights into eco-creativity as an artistic philosophy and practice. And we're hoping that this will really propel what we hope will be an eco-creative turn in society. And these ideas are also going to be part of Pearl's work that we're currently doing with the University of Arts Helsinki. We're working uh, specifically with the Theatre Academy there, uh, working on their next colloquium of artistic research in performing arts. It will be um, set in Helsinki in 2025, um, and it will be focused on ecological design and performance pedagogy, sustainable practices, and interdisciplinary acts in a climate change world with a, with a very clear focus on eco-creativity at the heart of that. So we're looking forward to working with our international colleagues on, on bringing that discourse to life. And that's... Um... Yep, sorry. Yeah, we were gonna we were gonna end with a little bit of a provocation, actually, or I suppose a, a question rather than a statement. Um, we with we I suppose what I'm interested um, is thinking about this ecological turn or the eco creative turn um, that Natalie was just mentioning. Thinking about the question of whether the next the coming decades could be framed as a time of potential, one where educators, culture makers, and broader society rise to the challenge of what it means to bring an ecological perspective into their work, not because they are forced to, but because they embrace the transformative potential that it brings. Thank you. Yeah, and with that, that's all from us <laughs> for now. <laughs> and thanks again, Carrie and Climate Action Beacon. Thank you, everyone. Bravo. Thanks for coming to have a, have a, have a listen. Bravo. Wonderful work. Was I right or what? That was fantastic um, to see the, um, you know, the suite of projects um, that Pearl is initiating in this space. It's just um, fantastic. Um, and the creative community engagement for me is um, the way in which we engage people in these discussions and what you're doing um, with Pearl is, um, is such an important contribution when people aren't enthused by, um, you know, uh, science and economics, you know, um, there are other ways to tell this story and um, it's just fantastic work. Um, so, and I'm wondering too, if you're going to um, see Rufus Norris at the Royal Theatre in London and have a conversation there. So I hope you're going to do that one day too soon. <laughs> um, well, what I might do is I might um, uh, open up the um, the conversation. I think, um, Natasha, are you going to um, enable people's uh, Yep, so everyone videos? can access their camera and their microphone now if you want to ask a question or join the discussion. And it would be lovely to see your faces, actually. So um, if you feel up for it, um, please let us see who you are and please raise your hand if you have a question. Um, just while people are um, just while people are getting their questions ready, perhaps, and um, and thinking about what they've just heard, um, actually, Caro, you've got your question, your hand up there as number one. So I might throw to you before I take Hi, the privilege. There you go. Hi, just a quick question. That's a, that was brilliant, actually. I just love the whole philosophy of it. Um, I'm a musician. I'm just wondering where or if. Um, you know, music fits into this at all. I'd love to get involved, yeah. That's great. Um, yes, we are actually, um, our next kind of, um, I suppose, research uh, is broadening a little bit into green music. That seems like the the next kind of uh, topic on the agenda, which fits really nicely with performing arts. There are similar challenges, different but similar in terms of for the most, uh, I think the most intersectional between those two disciplines are uh, is touring uh, and venues, and and particularly in 
in the Australian context, uh, sustainable touring and um, how we manage that in Australia as opposed to not necessarily in a big country that we live in uh, where, the, for example, our colleagues in the UK have done awesome work um, with travelling on, you know, on trains across Europe. Um, we have we have different challenges here, mm. uh, for example. That's one of the biggest yeah ones that that I think is um, still uh, there's some great resources arts on tour um, is doing amazing work um, in kind of green initiatives in this space and green music Australia but I think it's something to that still needs further um, exploration how do we find out more about that and sort of keep in touch with what's going on um, maybe if you want to send us an email that might be the best way in in the interim okay yep how do, how do I email you? Um, do I put it in the chat? Uh, Nellie's going to put it in the chat. Awesome, thank you. Is that yours? Yeah, it's fine. Thanks. Are there any other questions from the audience? I've got 10 backed up in my mind. Oh, here we go, Vanessa thank Tomlinson. You. Oh, yep. Yeah. I'll just get you to raise your, um, lower your hand, please, Caro. Thank Thanks you. for that, Tanya mm. and Natalie and Linda and Kerry. That was awesome, as always, to hear all these projects. I'm wondering about the transformational power of the programming part of your work. It's It all looks fantastic. I'm just wondering about reception of that and what mm. the sort of carry forward is or if you're tracking that part of it. You talked about that a bit with NIDA and the future graduates, but I'm thinking about the creative programming parts, the circus, the flood mm. projects, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's one of the, that's going to be one of the questions that we ask in our culture for climate survey. So one of the um, industry partners was actually interested in thinking about how that gets communicated, you know, whether there's, um, and a bigger uptake in programs, oh, sorry, in sh in shows that have these eco themes in them. And so that's, I guess, that's the first step of thinking about whether audiences respond more, whether it's numbers or whatever, in terms of um, eco programming. But I think it's a bit hard. Like a lot of times, shows that tend to have eco themes tend to be very preachy and people tend to shut off. So, how does that then factor in the way that the stories are told and how we tell them? Yeah, I think that's a, that's an ongoing that's a, an ongoing research topic actually because um, I think when we start when it, when we did our culture for climate report across the three P's in which programming is one it was actually quite difficult to find mm. the shows um, or the pieces that were ecological or climate change focused they didn't necessarily have it in the title um, and sometimes you'd read the blurb and um, not quite sure and some of them you know the setting was the climate crisis and um, there's an amazing uh, climate dramaturg actually um or who talks about everything every theater show that is produced is produced in the context of the climate crisis uh anything that it says it, that it is otherwise is a lie um because that is the world in which we are operating in so um yeah it's quite interesting to think about um do we need to be focused on eco theater specifically mm. or is all theater essentially in the ecological crisis like mm. there's there's i think more to unpack in in that yeah thanks vanessa carrie did you have another question or is your hand just unusually up <laughs> <laughs> that's all right um I'll just ask, I was wondering about um, the Culture for Climate report and whether there was any reference to, um, I have a real bugbear at the moment based on the um, 2023 Climate Action Survey results that I'm looking at at the moment um, against conflating climate change impacts with um, disaster, natural mm -hmm. severe weather events. Um, so with that caveat, <laughs> um, there has been some work emerging around um, uh, the impact of climate on uh, music events or on sporting events and other mm -hmm. cultural events. And I'm just wondering if um, if that was a part of Culture for Climate, the impact of um, severe weather events um, and disaster events upon the, the industry and we, its performance. Yeah, we did mention it because when talking about, when in, in the report we acknowledged that a lot of theatres actually went under 
like literally. Yeah, right. Um, because of the floods, right? And like Nopo is one of them. Even Queensland Theatre was one of them. And that shows just couldn't happen because they were directly impacted by severe weather events. What's what's really interesting is those. Um, I think with with that when we showed that there's a we didn't show it on the slides actually. There are a couple of photos that we have of theatres mm -hmm. being underwater, um, mm -hmm. as in flooded flooded theatres. Um, Norpa, for example, uh, you know, completely flooded. So you can see, um, you know, that the 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 water is taken over the. Um, the auditorium, foyer, yeah. the foyer, same with Queensland Theatre. When you show that picture to performing arts uh, practitioners, they th there is a, a mic drop moment. Um, suddenly it's like, oh, um, sometimes I've noticed that it's, that image is quite, uh, it's like it, it all, it suddenly makes sense to them that actually uh, uh, it's not only the climate in crisis, but theatre is also going to be in crisis. I mean, we know that, but mm. perhaps a picture like that sometimes brings it home because it feels so tangible and so real. Um, I don't know if that has explicitly made those organisations who have had that impact yet kind of put climate policies in place. Those are the things that we're Frank, still Frank, still researching, to be honest. It's it's to be honest, it's still very early days mm -hmm. for the cultural sector. We've we've um we've caught up a lot, you know, in recent years, but it's still there's so much information still to find out and things are travelling pretty quickly. Um not to put her on the spot, but Imogen Ross is here from NIDA. Imogen was, mm -hmm. she's having a wave there. I just want to acknowledge Imogen because she was part of our team, um, you know, in doing these resources for NIDA. And um, she's also part of our Culture for Climate Report. She was also part of our Culture for Climate Report. And so, <laughs> so she's, yeah, so thanks, Imogen. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about NIDA because um, in terms of the update and where NIDA's going now that you've rolled out, you started rolling out these resources, how that's all travelling. If you care to comment, that is. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Natalie and Tanya um, and Kerry, for hosting this seminar. It's fantastic um, to be a part of it and to see so many of these conversations happening now on a really regular basis. Um, and a lot of it has been spearheaded by Pearl and the connections and collaborations that you've been forging over the last few years. Um, I'm actually head down, bum up right now, writing my... Um, presentation for NIDA Open Day, which happens tomorrow, which is all about, it's called Embedding Green into the Curriculum. And I'm literally looking at all of the um, the work that we've done together and the um, initial conversations we had with um, the Institute for Sustainable Futures um, and the work we're doing with Theatre Green Book and sort of putting them all out so that we can showcase what we're doing to the public tomorrow. And the main through line that we're saying is this is about the future like we're training the future and we, we've already got one of our graduates is is in the UK and Denmark and Paris at the moment doing lighting design and he's having conversations with people about environmental sustainability and talking about what he uh, what he has done here at NIDA and um, what he hopes to do and who he wants to collaborate with. So we're really excited that already we're seeing um, the, the tip of the iceberg sort of flowing into the industry. But in about two years' time, every single one of our um, BA and MFA graduates will have had sustainability training um, and a handful of them will be what we're sort of calling um, – it's like the green captains or the green stewards. They will have had extra responsibilities and they will actually have that as a badge on their CVs. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited as a tertiary institution to to sort of be part of this move and, yeah, part of the conversation. So, yeah, it's it's been and, – and Pearl was very much part of that transition for us. So thank you again. Thanks, Imogen. That's wonderful, Imogen, and certainly, you know, all hands on deck, isn't it? These wonderful collaborations across institutions and organisations are, are, you know, where we can mm -hmm. be most productive. So fantastic that Pearl's a part of that too. Mark, Grant, 
Thanks, Kerry, and hi everyone. Uh, Mark Grant here from Griffith Sustainability. I'm relatively new to Griffith, um, and it's wonderful to hear this work. So, not a question, but a, a comment to say um, congratulations to the, to the team, Tanya and Natalie, and others for this fantastic piece of work. And it was exciting just then to hear Imogen about your work in embedding sustainability in in your coursework and things. So, one of the pieces of work that I'm working on, got my head down, bum up is uh, a climate action plan for Griffiths University and it will be fantastic to be able to write some of these activities into that plan. So yeah, just a comment to say congratulations on the excellent work and um, yeah, sustainability at Griffiths is here to help and I see my colleague Patricia Lee online. So um, yeah, it's, it's great to see this work happening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark, and lovely to meet you. You too, Tanya. Kerry, I think your mic is muted. Mm, always somebody, and that's me, and I've done it for everybody else, okay? <laughs> so um, there you go. Uh, Louise, Devonish, please ask your question. Oh, hi, hi, folks. I'll have to I'll remember to look down here. Um, thank you so much for such an awesome uh, presentation. I've been following your work from afar for a little while, and it's really, really exciting to hear you talk about it um, in this way. So thank you very much for making this a public thing that we can all come to. Um, I'm based down in Victoria. I'm a musician, um, and I'm very interested in the crossover in the things that you're talking about in the theatre and performance space as to what's happening in music as well. So um, like someone else, who I think it was Caro, who asked earlier, I'd love to write to you and um, yeah, share some thoughts and ideas. And it was very interesting just now to hear you talk about the three Ps, because um, I've been thinking about the three Cs in relation to music and um, going with uh, creativity, conceptual uh, and curatorial frameworks and mm -hmm. how not just the climate crisis, but also social justice issues are really informing how Australian musicians are making and programming and presenting work. And so these questions around, um, yeah, how, how people are making work in terms of the content and then also the practicalities of it are, are really, really interesting. And I think from, um, uh, I guess, a music perspective, but every every performing arts really, these questions around touring and how do we do that from all the way down here in Australia when there's such mm -hmm. pressure within our mm -hmm. culture to get our work overseas. Um, yeah. So I'd love to speak with you about some of the things I've, he I've been hearing recently in the music space as to how people are thinking about touring, um, what's changing, what isn't, what are things that have been happening in Australia for a long time because touring for us is so expensive anyway and time consuming. Um, re really exciting. Um, so again, sorry, this is more of just uh, positive comments rather than questions. But the other thing that sprang to mind, uh, Tanya, just then when you were talking about those photos of flooded theatres, mm -hmm. which would be fascinating to see, I was reminded of something I saw in the media a while ago around sport and um, mm. climate events. And there's this really famous image of some cricketers, I think somewhere in regional Victoria, New South Wales, playing cricket, but this huge bushfire behind them and this wall of flame metres from the pitch. And what's so shocking about that image is not just this wall of flame behind these people playing cricket, is that they kept playing for like hours mm. after this this thing had happened. And so this weird, these mm. weird ideas of wall and like carrying on as if nothing's happen happening, there's that sort of mm. narrative running in parallel with what you're talking about in, as far as everything we're doing is happening in the context of the climate crisis as well. So anyway, lots of ideas there. Sorry for no question, but just thrilled to hear about what you're doing and, and thank you very much. Thanks so much, Louise. It was, it's been great to meet you and hear about what you're doing as well, particularly because we're, we're out kind of broadening into music um, moving forward. Like the wider culture. Um, yeah. yeah, we're sort of just kind of performing arts is kind of where the three of us as co-directors are situated in. Um, but and we're only, what, a year and, and a bit old, mm. actually, as a research lab. So um, which is kind of crazy because it's been a, it's been a lot of, you know, maybe what, a year and four months or yeah. something, you know, almost a year and a half old. So, um, yeah, so thinking about broadening out into the wider cultural sector is really important. Um, but please reach out to us and, and maybe we can catch up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, love to. Um, maybe see you at APAX if you're coming down this way. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Great. Oh, wonderful. Um, 
Yeah, it must be some heritage considerations with some of those theatres. Is that right? Some of the flooding of those theatres? No. Oh, no, it's a, no, not well, the ones that we know. I don't think so mm. because it, Queensland Theatre was it's, the Billy Brown studio. I don't know if anyone knows that. Brisbane people might know that one. Uh, and Norpa was their main cultural. I think they've only got one performing arts centre. I don't think it's a heritage. No, they're newer buildings. Yeah. Um, whether it's, they're officially listed or not, I imagine that there'll be some intersections mm. with, you know, um, local community heritage. Mm. Oh, I'm yeah. thinking about the, yeah, the yeah. work of Sarah Baker and others mm, around mm. Um, community heritage, but I'll leave that. Yeah. I'll park yeah. that. Um, if nobody else has got an, another question, I might ask one, um, curly one, um, and I guess a difficult question to to ask is um, how are you, I know that, that you mentioned in your um, bio, Natalie, about um, decolonising your work. Um, how is Culture for Climate and Pearl broadly um, working with First Nations um, people and communities and um, how are you decolonising your work? It seems to me that um, even the idea of a climate crisis yeah. um, distorts mm -hmm. um, the, all the reasons why we're having a climate mm -hmm. crisis and, and again marginalises yeah. the perspective of First Nations people yeah. and communities. So, yeah. yeah, over to you. And one of the things I think we're well, that we're going to be exploring in the book as well is that notion of how um, eco-pedagogy comes in, which is very much linked to that critical consciousness that um, there are some communities and some um, groups and communities that tend to be affected more by the climate crisis, right? Um, what we're also very conscious about, and this has fed into our one of our a, a grant application that we're wait, um, that we've applied for, is to have an advisory board that is made up of First Nations representatives mm. and First Nations elders, because we are very much aware that there are certain knowledges that we don't have access to, and we're very much on land that is not ours, and that, as I said at the beginning um, of the presentation, is that is that First Nations people have always seen the ecological and the cultural as intertwined. And perhaps that's not as obvious more in more contemporary, I guess, views that the ecological is separate to the cultural. And so one of the things is we're very conscious of that and that we are seeking out, you know, First Nations advisors when it comes to writing about the climate, when it comes to writing about land that and waters that are affected by the climate. Fantastic. But also we come from, uh, and we also come from a very much grassroots background, all, all three of us. So mm. in terms of who we see ourselves as researchers, we always go back to the communities um, and, and trying to input as much of community collaborations as much as possible. And that's well, part of that decentering of knowledge, knowledge systems. Great. And were there, um, with that original pilot study, were there um, Indigenous-led owned performing arts organisations yeah, we reached that? we reached out to a number and the one that you know that picture that we had of the Barramundi Him, the Pim Pim oh, yeah. The, yeah so um with the, that company they work with a lot of theatre Kimberley theatre Kimberley that's it they work with a lot of um what are they called like rangers yeah yeah first nations first rangers. Na nations right. rangers in creating those works Wonderful. so yeah most of those projects that they do are first nations led projects um as an organisation that works in the Kimberley um, and um, they work, they actually work with in environmentalists and ecologists um, to do the work that they do, which is basically outdoor, very um, large puppetry works um, that are very much embedded in, in community. Um, we are working, so we, the at the moment, we, uh, as, as we mentioned, we're doing a conference in Helsinki. We're mm -hmm. co-curating co a conference in Helsinki. Um, and we have a First Nations Australian um, Keynote. artist keynote that we've invited and uh, to come to uh, Helsinki with us, who will be funded. Um, Dylan, I'm just Vander, Vander, Vanderberg. I don't know if you know Dylan Vanderberg. I don't know if Imogen knows Dylan Vanderberg. First Nations um, playwright. playwright from well playwright playwright and performance artist from Tasmania uh currently doing his PhD in Canberra and um and will be and he's going to be coming to be one of our keynotes in Helsinki and that's also with an indigenous Finnish yeah 
uh, not speaker. So no, we, not no, indigenous not keynote indigenous. speaker, yeah. but there'll be first. We're interested in part of that will be a collaboration with First Nations uh, Finnish and First Nations Australian. That's fantastic. Um, Salvi, Salvador, you had a question. Hey, guys. Can you see me? Hi. Hey, how you doing? Uh, fantastic project. Really inspiring, I find. Um, and particularly, like, that previous conversation with Kerry's um, question around uh, decolonization is something that I'm particularly interested in. And it was, um, it was curious, I found it really curious in uh, the term that you use, the eco-creative turn in society. Mm -hmm. I, I think like that is, I haven't heard it being phrased like that before. So I, I was particularly curious about uh, your ideas around that. And from what I can pick up, the decolonization happens in amongst other places in the decentralization of the knowledge right so i'm wondering after the performances have you noticed any difference in the conversations that audiences are having you know in the way that the knowledge has been decentralized through the performances it, you know is that what's happening and is that the implication for society more broadly in the eco-creative turn if that even makes sense. <laughs> I think I think part of our research moving forward is to work out what the eco-creative turn is explicitly because um, it is that that's I mean the reason we've kind of made ourselves write a book about it is so that we can actually properly explore it and and um, interrogate what mm. that means. I think um, in many ways uh the eco-creative is a counteraction um for the eco-efficiency. So often when we think about climate mitigation, all of this stuff is really important, obviously. Um, we often talk about eco-efficiencies. And the word eco-efficiency often does not uh, kind of have a holistic interconnected symbiotic approach um it's it's very and the word efficiency is a bit of a problem here too um because it's sort of you know what is the quickest and easiest thing that we can do to make um a reduction happen which is in of itself not a bad prospect but it is part of it needs to be part of a bigger picture and i think often old ideas of sustainability have been about um science first and and culture second or culture is not even mentioned or the arts is not even mentioned as part of it and um i think a big part of that is to kind of bring those things back again um and to kind of see culture and creativity as part of that conversation and in the work that i i see my work as eco-creative um in the sense that it's very holistic in, in the way in which i work with communities around uh greening projects um so i create uh, one one of my projects is a recyclable biodegradable edible biodiverse performance space that we grow with the local community the local community comes and performs in the space and then we eat the stage so all of that is framed around creativity um and the thing is when you show audiences and communities the possibilities of thriveability then conversations open up and even politics, a lot of my stuff is very apolitical um, because I often work in regional communities where uh, there are political divides. And when I work in those regional communities on the ground, I a big part of my work is to also almost be subversive. So I'm making the ecological fun and engaging and exciting and community orientated so that every it, those conversations open up um people that normally don't talk to one another come together because it's fun because it's interesting because it's non-threatening um so that's my tactic is a non-confrontational tactic it's because i'm a i'm a bit of a non-confrontational kind of person um you know in many ways it's also because um that's I um, there are many ways to have conversations. There are many ways to um, to talk about the climate. And my approach is very much in um, celebration celebration of of local communities, of local culture, of local um, stories, of local 
flora and fauna. Um, celebration is, I suppose, culture's um, kind of secret weapon. Uh, probably weapon mm -hmm. is not the right word, but, you know, um, secret um, kind of ingredient. ingredient. Yeah. Celebration is often not part of what we talk about. When we talk about climate crisis, we don't often talk about celebration. Um, and that 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 to me is is a missed opportunity because we have a lot of work to do on this agenda and we need to celebrate the wins along the way. Otherwise, we're not going to get there. We have to support one another and we have to celebrate the wins along the way. And um, I think another thing that we talked about, I know Imogen is part of this conversation when we're doing the NIDA work, which also had an eco-creative um, uh structure to it as well was um don't let the don't let perfect be the enemy of good you know um and and that is often people don't even want to start because they can't be perfect and there's no such thing as perfection anyway um and these things are complex but we need to make one every you know we need to celebrate the wins often it's three steps forward one step back um but we need to also come together to um yeah, to consolidate and um, be in community. Um, I don't know how to move forward on the climate uh, crisis without a, a, a really strong sense of community um, in doing these actions. Great answer. Thanks, Natalie and Tanya. Um, Ali Bishop. Hey. Um. Thanks both or all for um, the presentation. It's been really amazing so far and I've had a chance to be exposed to some of the work that was discussed, um, particularly Tanya's um, Flood Resilience Theatre Project. And that kind of ties into a question I have and I hope it's not too left field, but I was really interested in what your um, eco-performative, eco-creative, eco-pedagogical frameworks have to say about time. Um, I guess I'm thinking about slowness mm -hmm. and, you know, the need and, and imperative for slowness and things like uh, community engagement, particularly working with Indigenous communities and how to balance that against all sorts of ideas of urgency or these kind of like fast paced um, time frames. So urgency very much being the narrative around um, responses to climate change. Um, and there's also some really interesting um, Indigenous thinking around that as well and the sort of risk of urgent responses to climate change and how they can sort of leap over the kinds of engagements with communities and kinships that are required to, to, to do this kind of repair. And, you know, you also have all of the urgencies that are associated with like cultural programming and, you know, grant cycles and... Yeah, I don't know. I think for me, it's it's interesting because, yeah, and the, just a side note at the end of this statement slash question is, you know, I, had, I spent a lot of time in Berlin working with this particular artist whose, you know, conceptual framework was all about addressing and thinking about climate change. You had, you know, department, material departments looking at sustainable materials. You'd have travel plans, which were, you know, you always have to catch trains, et cetera, et cetera. So there'd be all these like careful thinking around carbon footprints and conceptual mm. frameworks and da da, -da. And it would all go out the window if, um, if when time pressure sort of crunched at the end. And I don't know, that's that's a bit more of a sort of a direct thinking about time. But I, I guess, yeah, temporality feels to me like a, a core part of, of what it might mean to work with um, in an eco-performative framework, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think we specifically thought about time in that way. But yes, we, we were very conscious of that that urgency of of having to actually um at least uh acknowledge sustainable uh, environmental sustainability in things like cultural policy right um that's one of the things of that urgency of of that is not even you know talked about because sustainability is something that is actually over a long period of time and people often tend to look at sustainability in terms of financial sustainability which is a long long-term planning, but environmental sustainability is not even on the cards. Um, but we were kind of conscious, like when we were trying to reach out to First Nations theatre companies to be part of our um, report and to be part of our project, we, under we, we, we understood that um, the relationship building requires time 
And so, yeah. And so that was something that I guess we were conscious of, although it didn't kind of feed into, I guess, the immediacy of what we were writing about for, for some of the projects. Hmm. I think I think time is a really interesting one that needs further thought. I think, as I mentioned before, like uh, as eco creativity being a counteraction against eco efficiency in some ways, um, and efficiency is like kind of that like very that urgency, you know. Mm. But when you're trying to be efficient at something, I don't know if you think about it in your daily life, efficiency. Um, doesn't necessarily efficiency can be done in a rush and doesn't take in the whole picture and we can miss things by being super efficient and we live in a very hyper efficient in inverted commas mm. world uh, which I would say um, based on things that I have read about and and conversations with First Nations colleagues that First Nations cultures tend to not think about efficiency so much maybe maybe they do but not maybe in the way that we think about it um and uh and i think that efficiency tends to be much more of a western and i would even say neoliberal con construct um so while there is an urgency um maybe both can be true Maybe both can be true that we need to certain we have there's an urgency around um, to a certain extent being efficient about things that we do need to do uh, to get on this agenda ASAP. But at the same time, um, we don't want to be too rushed that we actually, um, you know, that we go backwards. Um, because often if anybody's also done an art project where they've rushed something, sometimes I know as a designer I've rushed mm. something that I've had to make and then I have to make it again because I rushed it too much and I didn't do it properly. So, that you know, these are kind of things, I think, learnings from two sides of the coin, and I don't think it's an either or there. I think both can be true. But I think for far too long we've talked too much about efficiencies and eco-efficiencies and not enough about the holistic um, kind of eco-creative approach. Um, and I do think that quick responses and slow responses can be part of the same picture as well and they both serve a role and, and maybe complete the picture in many ways um, in what they do. Yeah, there's one different. one without the other. I think both of them need to be there, right, in different ways. So, and I was going to say, yeah, just to 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 um to find that point that uh, there's a lot of critique around the idea of urgency, not only from the point of view that Kerry brought up earlier, which is that you know these kind of distractions of loss of worlds has been yeah. happening for hundreds of years, actually, um, for a lot of indigenous communities, but also because you know as some indigenous um, uh, scholars in the environmental humanities have been pointing out that you know, the kind of re reparative work that needs to be done is is going to take time. So, yeah. But, yeah, thanks thanks for your response. It's a really um, an interesting discussion and a wonderful opportunity and perhaps celebration of a, um, a collaboration with um, First Nations performing arts or a performing artist. I mean, it would be wonderful to have that. And this whole, the temporal spatial dimensions of climate change are, uh, I mean, clearly there's a need for a slowdown, um, but there's also this hysteria that follows um, that follows climate change. And I think um, in your work, there's what's normative and what's descriptive. You know, what's there's the systems and structures that you're working within that you you know require a response. And but there's also the way in which the work can slow things down for everyone. So there's a lot. Of, I mean, we want it to be a linear, don't we? We want it to be watch this and then do that, but um, the extraordinary complex complexity of, you know, the climate and environmental crisis that we face are such that um, we won't find that linear dimensions, but um, it's certainly not time to shy away from the complexity in a hurry or slowly, <laughs> I'd say. Um, any other questions from the from people? Just on that, I did want to say about the slowness um, versus urgency thing. Um, one of the um, one of the things that I am personally inspired by is the notion of transitions theory. Um, this idea of radical ideas not rushed, um, I think, is also another way to look at it. It's not to say that it. Um, I mean, the idea of not rushing something, I think, is where I perhaps a. Um, the word rush is 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 important here about not 
yeah, not rushing something. That doesn't mean that it can't happen if quickly and effectively to some degree, but there's a certain, there's something to do with rushing, which when we know mm. when we rush, not <laughs> we rush to make the train, we rush to mm. do something else. You know, we forget the keys, we forget the things. Um, there is something about rushing that to me as a word around time, um, I think um, sits closer to home for me personally. Um, and also I think we can learn from in the, in the climate context. Yeah, wonderful. It's um, it's it's a it's a really interesting discussion because it, because I think that even within the industries that you're working in, but all industries and all society, this social and cultural dimension mm -hmm. um of um of climate change is is the hard science. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I just think that that's 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 the most that's the most difficult thing that we face is actually how to move, and it's and the reality is really, it's new for us all. No one's faced a climate crisis before. Every, everywhere, you know that that hysteria is often around um, feeling like we have we have to know and we should have responses for something that we've never encountered before. And mm. so any anything that um, encourages us to sit in that space and learn from each other and and listen to each other um is um is fantastic i just think it's a wonderful project any final well if we have got, have we got any other questions oh imogen hello hello oh i've got my microphone mm -hmm. um it wasn't so much a question it was just building in a way on what you just said um natalie and tanya and kerry is that the bravest thing to do is to start and to walk into the dark um what and that's something that i'm finding working with students and and teachers mm -hmm. here is that people are really scared of getting it wrong and i think i mean we're in an institution where people are being assessed and mm -hmm. so there's this and and watched you know because they're being watched mm -hmm. to you know and and judged and so there there does seem to be the conservatism and the reluctance to move forward is often about this perceived sense of being judged and what happens if we get it wrong. So there's a the lot of that negativity that comes up mm. is often about, well, what about this? Or have you thought about that? And a lot gets thrown back at me mm. that I need to be the guru or that I need to have solutions. And what I've started saying is I really don't know, but I want to find out, you know, and kind of indicating how can we do this together? And trying very much to just say, let's just start. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter if we fail, at least we've started. And then what we learn from failure is going to be incredible. So yeah, just sort of, yeah, pushing forward into the dark, going, none of us have the answers. And some of the things we think are right will be proven to be wrong in the future. Mm -hmm. Um and to be able to be humble enough to know that 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 is going to happen. And but that's okay, you know. We're doing. We've got to do our best with what we know now, and you know. And, but not wait for the answers. So that's yeah. That's in a way my big learning curve here at NIDA is to to not be afraid of not knowing, but just to you know to try and find some hands to hold on to and walk into the dark with them. Thanks, Mitchin. Yeah, that that's great. I think that's that's. I definitely feel that a lot. And every every project that I do I feel like I'm <laughs> I'm always failing at something and I've got to learn from it that's part of that's part of it I I wanted to share something that that, that kind of relates to what Imogen was saying around um uh acknowledging our our own failures and and footprints and things like that I suppose um what I've been doing with the first years um this trimester I teach a class called form space and process um, we have to do a lot of making. Um, so with my first years, we do, we've been making things with reclaimed materials. So all the stuff that gets left over from open days and, and grad shows and things from the, that, you know, that I, that basically that's all over around here, the college, um, the Queensland College of Art and Design has lots of things that are always left over every year. I, I kind of, you know, boxes, packing boxes, all sorts of things. I gather them up and and kind of have a whole bunch of resources, um, magazines, brochures and things like that, and the students work with that. Um, that's perhaps um, not that interesting, but one of the things that I've been trialling with them is they have to make something temporary. Um, so one of the things they had to make was like wearable architecture where they had to kind of construct um, 
you know, these kind of forms on the body and, and then do a kind of fashion pro parade. Um, and then as part of the the assessment, and because this is a temporary work, they actually have to unmake everything. So they have to not only, they have to make for deconstruction. So they have to design for deconstruction, make for deconstruction. So we, again, there's no hot glue. Um, there's staples. I think they can use staples and masking tape, but they're encouraged to find other methods of making for de deconstruction or design for disassembly. They then have to unmake everything at the end of class and photograph their landfill pile um, and reflect on it. And I, and I said to them, you're not going to get marked down uh, if you have a bigger landfill file pile, uh, landfill pile, um, but I want you to reflect on it. And they have to let it write a little reflective essay on their whole process, including their design for deconstruction. Um, they take a photo of everything that can be, because they deassemble de everything, they take a photo of everything that can go into either recycling into the bin or in, in the recycling, or they can go for further resources for the students for next next year. Mm -hmm. um, but then they have their landfill pile, and it's amazing how they reflect on it. And not one student has complained about me making this as part of their assessment. They've, they've complained about all, all, all other things, but not that one. They actually, or pretty much all the students said they loved the sustainability focus. They loved that they had to think about it. Mm. And they were quite proud of, you know, how their land, they had to do three projects and document their landfill pile. And quite a few of them at the end said, my landfill pile got smaller. I'm really happy about that. And um, and what I thought was really good, because it wasn't about shaming them for their landfill piles at all. It was going, this is something we are learning um, and you, it's up to you to decide and reflect on that. And and um, and I didn't even give them that much information about this was not a sustainability subject. This was just this is how we do things here at the Queensland College of Art and Design. Um, but I think it was a bit of a testing ground for me to explore how do young people um, relate to this what 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 you know what is going on for them and again the not shaming around this because uh, it's acknowledgement of actually because often we and a lot of the students said normally I don't think about things when I take them apart and throw them away mm -hmm. but actually now I have to think about it and I have to take and look one student did used a lot of staples you know in her construction mm -hmm. like Staple, 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 staple. It was beautiful, but a lot of staples. She painstakingly sat there for two hours and took every staple out from her construction um, and uh, and said, my gosh, that was a lot of work, you know, to take every staple out. It took me two hours. And then I'm thinking, okay, maybe I could have maybe used less staples. Um, but anyway, to her, that was a learning process and an experience. Um, but the dedication for the student taking out each staple was very, um, that was something I had never seen before. So I just wanted to share that. What I, um, well, I think um, we're getting close to time. I think it's a wonderful place, you know, that, um, oops, Christine's got a, a heart up just in mm -hmm. case she was going to ask a question. Um, I think that is that, um, you know, a million interventions right you know like that we shouldn't um that that creative intervention in the way in which we think about ourselves and our relationship to this place um through students through audiences through organizations through whatever um are really really important so um if it's okay for you with you natalie and tanya um I just want to thank everyone for coming along. Of course, thanks thanks to the audience and thanks for your wonderful questions and the discussions. I told you it was wonderful work and I'm hoping that you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, thanks so much to Tanya and, um, and, and Natalie for the presentation, but to the three of you, Tanya, Natalie and Linda, for your wonderful work. Um, with with um, with Pearl, I just can't wait to see um, what happens what happens next. So thanks very much from me and the Climate Action Beacon and um, just can't wait to, to hear about the next chapter and all very best with all those funding applications and, you know, the future of Pearl. We'll hear about it again soon, no doubt. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks so much, Kerry, for having us. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Imogen. Thanks, thank Louise. You. Okay, bye now. Bye. Bye.
Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. We're here. Everything, everyone, everyone, good. Did you enjoy that? That was fantastic. Yes. You got so much positive response from people. Yeah. Yeah. Really, and it was great to have Imogen there from NIDA, and I think mm -hmm. we've still got Gary. I think. I think um, Gary's um, <laughs> not watching. <laughs> watching <laughs> Gary been found out um but yeah fantastic it was a really good presentation a really good overview of your work and it's just you know uh just really fingers crossed for that linkage and for everything else that you've got in but thanks so much it was wonderful Thank thanks yeah. Carrie. all right then happy right, friday happy friday happy friday happy friday okay bye guys bye. see ya bye Thank mm -hmm. you.